from the Joy News Center. This is News at 8. Good evening to our ABN viewers in London and the rest of Europe. And a good morning to those watching online in Russia and elsewhere in Asia. You're welcome to the primetime bulletin here on Joy News on Multi TV. In this edition, more revelations from investigations into operations of Savannah Accelerated Development Authority. So Judgment Debt Commissioner blames negligence and unpatriotic public officers for massive amounts paid out as inordinate judgment debts. University teachers threaten to boycott lectures on April 15 over scrapping of book and research allowances. We we'll bring you the latest on the MPP's preparation for its National Delegates Congress in Tamale this weekend and details of the accident involving Kwabna Ejepong, who wants to become general secretary. And education authorities in Ejisu Jabing municipality show the way in tackling teacher absent absenteeism. We also have business showbiz international news. Whilst in sports, George Ado Jr. has the very latest news about the highly anticipated bout between Aite Powers and Bukum Bankum. Apparently, Aite Powers has put the bout on hold. Stay tuned. News at 8 with Israel Live. Now, as promised, we return to revelations emerging from Joy News' investigations into the operations of the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority established to coordinate development to bridge the gap between the North and South, but rather bedeviled by alleged corruption, improper award of contracts, among others. Tonight, Manasseh Zuriawone reports on some travels, which according to an auditor report cited by Joy News, suggest were wasteful and beyond the mandate of the authority. In 2012, management of SADA organized a trip for three officials to Turkey on behalf of some district assemblies. The CEO, Gilbert Sedu Idi, a minister of state at the presidency, Al Haj Mustafa Ahmed, and Mahama Shaibu, an executive assistant at SADA, embarked on this trip. This trip cost SADA some 226,000 Ghana cities. The trip, according to SADA management, was meant to facilitate sister city relationships on behalf of some district assemblies. An audit report on SADA states that the trip did not fall within SADA's mandate and did not bring any benefit to the authority. The report also says the 226,000 Ghana cities spent on the trip was not approved by the SADA board. The report recommends that Mr. Gilbert Sedu Idi should be surcharged with the amount. Joy News Checks also revealed that Chronum Investment Limited, the company paid over 84,000 Ghana cities to organize the trip, is not a travel or tour agency. It deals in ICT services, real estate development, and oil explorations, among others. Another unapproved expenditure on a trip, according to the audit report, was a trip to Birmingham and Berlin. Management of SADA paid about 70,000 Ghana cities to Casmet Seed Company to organize the trip. Joy News checks at the Registrar General's Department again revealed that this company too does not deal in travel and tour. It is into sale of seeds, construction of thefts, and agribusiness. The audit report also reveals that SADA could not account for about 14,000 U.S. dollars when it sponsored three officials to the 68th session of the U.N. General Assembly. SADA CEO Gilbert Idi, al Haj Mustafa Ahmed, and SADA board chairman al Hassan Andani embarked on this trip. Mr. al Hassan Andani has denied that the trip was to the U.N. General Assembly, as stated in the audit report. He told Joy News that SADA had a meeting in New York at the time the UN General Assembly was in session. He, however, admitted that there were issues with the receipts and they were being dealt with. For Joy News, Manasseh Azore Arene reporting. Now, the management of the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority is meanwhile questioning the basis for the allegations of financial malfeasance leveled against the authority in the audit report of 2011 to 2013. 
That officials say the issues raised in the audit report are not conclusive because they're yet to respond to them. The audit report, however, states, and I quote, our observations during the audit have been discussed with management and the responses incorporated in this management letter. Director of Finance and Resource Mobilization at SADA, John Kwakupom, has told Joy FM the audit process is still ongoing and would not engage the media on it in order not to compromise the process. There were a couple of issues here. Now, first of all, the audit is an ongoing thing, and these are quotes from him. The audit is an ongoing thing because we haven't received the final audit report. We're supposed to be responding to this management letter that came to us. We are to provide a response to this and then the final report, in my opinion, would be produced. He, however, went on to say that he did not think that the whole mandate of SADA has been fully understood by the general public and is a persistent negative publicity. The SADA Director of Finance and Resource Mobilization also talks about the investment of 74 million Ghana CDs as Stambik Bank. He said the account was quickly opened following an external consultant's advice, but insists the funds are intact. There's more to come on the story, so do stay tuned to our coverage on all platforms, TV, radio, and online. And our very next story, so judgment that Commissioner Justice Yapao says he, he's blaming the negligence and the lack of patriotism on the part of some public officials for most of the inordinate judgment debts that have come before it. He said, unfortunately, most of the monies have been paid out. Monies, he says, could have been used to provide the basic amenities lacking in many communities. Lamenting the loss of huge sums of monies to the state in the name of judgment debts, he said it was unfortunate some of these monies have already been paid. When the suit starts, it starts with a principal claim, maybe 10 million. Then they will go to court. Within years, the 10 million will balloon to say 140 billion. And some of these things that have been paid. And the Ghanaians who are behind it, Lawyers, officers from the AG's office who are supposed to go and defend, who will not go. Officers from some of the ministries who won't bother to do anything. And this money is continue to go. In a case titled Nana Sam Crunchy Arthur against the Attorney General and two others over the acquisition of land, men for the Jasikan District Assembly, the DCE Kilian Abrampa, appeared before the Commission for Clarifications. According to him, although the land in question is 68 acres, the Assembly occupies only 17.8 acres, with the rest occupied by encroachers. It was established that the lawyer for Sam Crunchy Arthur said Dumoga went to court prematurely. Nana Sankranchiata rushed to court to procure ju the judgment that initially was for the sum of 42,000 Ghana cities. Uh, presently, as I speak to you, as of September, this amount has ballooned to 993,000 Ghana cities. In another case titled Esther Buedu versus the Attorney General, due to negligent health care, it was established that there was a consent judgment of 30,000 Ghana cities to the plaintiff. In other news, the University Teachers Association of Ghana has threatened to boycott lectures on April 15 if government fails to initiate the process to pay its members' book and research allowance for the 2013-2014 academic year. Government in the 2014 budget statement indicated that as part of efforts to encourage research work in tertiary institutions, the existing system of payment of book and research allowances was to be reviewed and replaced with a research facility. UTAG maintains it cannot accept government's decision to scrap the allowances with the national or replace the allowances with the National Research Fund. They say it will hurt the career of development, the career development of lecturers. President of UTAG, Dr. Samuel Ousu Bequin, told journalists, UTAG is not opposed to the establishment of the National Research Fund. Instead, it wants the funds to complement the book and research allowances. 
despite our non-opposition to the establishment of a fund, we made it clear in unambiguous terms that we did not believe that the National Research Fund should lead to the obliteration of the existing book and research allowances. Today, Utah still stands by that conviction and strongly believes and wishes to state that the proposed National Research Fund and the book and research allowances can coexist. Officials also deny suggestions that they did not undertake any concise research to aid in the academic work and took time to explain to the media what they do with the book and research allowances and why scrapping them would affect them. For every day researched, at least I can be guaranteed some amount of money that I can use to pay the people who collect the data for me in the field. And therefore, if you say that you're taking away this kind of money and you're going to put it in a bigger fund where you are looking at the proposal that I'm coming to submit before you take a decision, then it means that you are depriving me of that ability to do research at a basic level, which doesn't only benefit me, it benefits the student who is using that as, his, as a PhD thesis and also even the society as a whole. The lecturers would have been entitled to an annual book and research allowance of $1,500, but this, they say, has never been enough. It has come to a point that even the money that's being given is no longer adequate for the kind of uh, work that we do. We have written to government for an upward adjustment of it. They have not responded. And instead of responding to that upward adjustment of the book and research allowance, now they came out to say that we are setting up a national research fund. Mind you, we, are, we have not said that we are against the establishment of the national research fund. And listen to the name given to it, national research fund, which means that any researcher, wherever the person finds himself, can have access to that research fund. So how come you want lecturers to sacrifice their resources to populate a fund and then make it open for everybody, including lecturers in the private universities, who have not sacrificed anything? The press conference ended with a caveat that government initiate the process to pay the allowances for this academic year, or they'll be compelled to lay down their tools. Also, a policy by education authorities in the Ejusu Jabi municipality to make deductions from the salaries of absentee teachers seem to have brought about a significant improvement in their attitude to work. A report by Shanti Region Correspondent Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin. Speaking at the 2012-2013 Municipal Best Teacher and Worker Award Ceremony, Municipal Director of Education said the policy has led to a sharp decline in absenteeism. He however says they are still confronted with teacher lateness. Gertrude Mensah says other directors may want to try a jusu jobbing, example in a bid to check the practice. 30 hard-working teachers and workers from the basic level to secondary were awarded. 28 years old Samuel Insaidu from Otre Krum MA Junior High School was adjourned overall best teacher. He received a 29 inch flat screen television plus a certificate. Municipal Chief Executive Kweku Efrifa Yamwa Ponko congratulated the award winners and advised them to continue the hard work to sustain the gains made so far. For those who will not be privileged. Work out, and I know your hard work will be recognized and rewarded accordingly come next year. Now, the youth of Infantsimani in the central region are demanding an apology from the Minister for Water Resources, Works and Housing for comments attributed to him they deem insulting of their chief. Colin Zada is said to have responded on radio to the chief's rebuke that he was responsible for delaying a water project for the area when the president visited recently. According to the youth, 
The thrust of the news conference was to iron out an issue that emerged in what they call a media coalition between the Minister for Water Resources, Works and Housing, Collins Dauda, and the acting president of the Ekufi Traditional Council, Nana Imperium VII, on the delay of the Isachir water supply project. According to the youth, the late President Mills, who hailed from the community, had a lot of passion for the development of Ekufi, especially water, which is one of the pressing needs of the people, hence the water project. The acting president of the Ekunfi Traditional Council, Nana Imperium, raised the issue about the delay when the president visited to inspect the project. Nana Imperium VII is alleged to have blamed the sector minister for the delay in processing the loan agreement for the additional work to commence to complete the water project for the flow of water to the people of Ekunfi. The minister is alleged to have responded on radio a few days later, asking the acting president of the Ekunfi Traditional Council not to behave ignorantly and that he did not know how things work in government concerning loans. The youth insist the minister must render an unqualified apology. We therefore request him to render an apology to the acting president of Ekunfi Traditional Council and the people of Ekunfi for saying the chief is ignorant. Our chief will never be ignorant in this instance as he is well informed about the situation on the ground. The Honorable Minister must also make sure as soon as possible the loan agreement for the project is put before cabinet for consideration and forwarded for parliamentary approval for its commencement. We fully support our chiefs for the welfare and development of the people of Ekunfi as well as the government of the day in any development of the people of Ekunfi and in Fantiman, but will also check and correct any government, any state's government official who abuses the courtesy of respect for our chiefs and elders in our districts and the country as a whole. Richard Kujinyakun's report from the Central Region. We're taking a break. We have more news coming up. Don't go away. Now, aspiring General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, Kwabene Japon Sky, was on Tuesday involved in an accident on the Kran Sumam Road. Speaking to join us with a shaky voice, Chairman of AFAC, Dr. Nana Yufri, also in the convoy, said the car somersaulted several times after entering a pool of water which had gathered on the road after it had rained. Yeah, Mr. Japon was sent to. Uh as a matter of fact, um, as much as we described this accident as a very terrible one, um, um, to the best of my physical impression, he was well. Uh, the only complaint of the was of pain in the right upper arm. And um, apart from that, there was no cut of me. Um, right, so, so Dr. Dr. Freire, the images we're seeing on social media, Facebook and other places, it's very terrible. I mean, did anybody, uh, is anybody in very critical condition or anybody dead? Nobody, uh, no, no one died, no one died, no one died. I'm telling you, like I said, it's a miracle. Um, I'm not going before we set off, um, the THL um, to the able hands of the good Lord, we had a prayer, and I think that we, we have survived by His grace. So you, you, are, um, you are part of the convoy, right? Absolutely. What, absolutely. Exa what exactly happened? It was raining, there about 1.30 p.m. And um, we had just left the Amazon area, using the new room mm. just behind us. Right. And um, I think there was a, 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 a kind of flood on the road. So the car skidded off the road, hit the gutter in between the the one leading to Kumasi and the one oh, leading yeah. to Afa. The car somewhat searched at several times, and then we, our car was, we ended up facing back to Afa in the other right. way. Yes, um, that, the car is destroyed. That, that, mu that must have been you very understand? frightening. I mean, you were in that, you were in, the same, you were in the same car, right? I was, I was what, what was going on in your mind when this was happening? I'm sure you were thinking, Jesus, this will be the end of you. My brother always could say, it's just Jesus, I just mentioned the car. Mm. 
Meanwhile, at Sparring National First, uh, Vice Chairman of the New Patriotic Party and former First Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Freddie Blay, is asking Ghanaians to totally reject the National Democratic Congress in the next general elections. Addressing delegates from about 14 constituencies of the Western region ahead of the party's delegates congress in Tamale this weekend, Freddie Blay described the current NDC government as clueless when it comes to addressing the country's problems. A report by Western Region correspondent William Benjamin Peters. Freddie Blay and his address indicated that the current NDC government has mismanaged the economy to the extent if care was not taken, the country would not be able to pay its workers. He called on the members of the opposition MPP to close their ranks and remain united to help boot the NDC out of power come the next general elections. According to him, he is motivated to join the race to help the NPP wrestle power from the governing National Democratic Congress in the 2016 general election. He noted that the MPP was the only political party that could salvage Ghana from the current economic hardship in that when it was in power from 2001 to 2008, the party changed the economy from HIPIC to lower middle income level. Freddie Blay stressed that he was a team player who would assist the national chairman to build an effective party when elected as first vice chairman of the NPP. Our responsibility is that if we work hard, if we run the extra mile, if we show that we are hungry for power and selflessly work, our party competitors will win the election. The various constituency chairmen later declared their support for Freddie Blay in his bid for the first vice chairmanship position of the NPP. And on behalf of all the representatives of the constituencies within the region, right. I stand on their behalf and we declare oh, oh, that oh, for Mr. Honorable Freddie Blay to be the first vice chairman. Oh. We're staying with politics and the Convention People's Party as part of its restructuring process will by the end of the year issue digitized biometric cards to registered members to help the party strategize for the 2016 elections. General Secretary Ivo Greenstreet also indicated the party will by December this year go to Congress to choose its national executives and flag bearer so it can prepare early for the polls. So what we have agreed upon is that between July and September the 30th of this year, those three months will be uh, for all constituency elections and all regional conferences of the party nationwide, uh, leaving uh, October, November as a period of time uh, where national officers will campaign and contest for positions that they seek to occupy at the December 2014 Congress. According to the General Secretary of the CPP, Ivor Greenstreet, officials are currently focused on settling the internal wranglings within the party to enable them prepare adequately for Congress. He added, the CPP needs to abide by its new constitution to enhance its integrity and There are some executives who will be unable to contest again in their positions because there was a constitutional change at our last Congress and which was that if you've been in an elected pos position for more than two terms you cannot contest. You can move to another position and contest another position but that same position you can only hold for two terms. So and that is right from the top to the bottom so that uh, creates a lot of open spaces for a lot of activity at the, at the constituency and regional level and we hope that will also create some vibrancy um, within the party um, uh, and you know change our fortunes. 
He notes the party is currently finalizing talks with the PNC to present a unified Nkrumah's front for the 2016 elections. Well, currently there's some extensive negotiations going on with the PNC and uh, I believe we're due to have a meeting within the next week or two which will be a large meeting of um, uh, groups within the party. Um, uh, we are very ready and uh, we believe that is something else that if we're able to succeed and achieve uh, would be very important for um, uh, creating a sense of unity for the people of Ghana to see that we're also serious and we're ready to compromise and uh, come together and unite around ideas rather than around our own ambitions and our own pride and our own ego. The CPP is meanwhile appealing to all its numerous supporters to unite and assist the party financially for victory in 2016. The Tisha District Police Commander sees 59 sacks of a substance suspected to be Indian hemp. Three suspects who have admitted to transporting the substance have also been apprehended. Whilst on patrol at about 2 a.m. on Monday, April 7, 2014, police officers at Tishi received a tip of that a group of men were offloading some sacks of illicit drugs from a truck at Bukwenshi in the town. The substance is said to have been packed alongside charcoal in the Kia truck with registration number BA55810 from Techiman to Accra. In total, we had 59 bags of substances suspected to be Indian. We had a driver in charge of the Kia truck and those two of the guys who helped in offloading the stuff from the vehicle. Three persons, 32-year-old Ernest Aj, the driver, 38-year-old Yao Samson, and 22-year-old Alex Oko, both unemployed, were arrested at the scene. The owner of the booty, whose nickname was given as Gugu, however, managed to escape. Even though the owner escaped, we managed to get pictures of him in the room. His photographs were in the room, so we picked those photographs. I'm using this medium to appeal to the public, those who know him, to advise him to come willingly. But if he fails to come, we have our men on the ground who are trailing him, and we will definitely get him wherever he is hiding. And then to those who are also in this business, should also know that once we have gotten Google, we will get them also by all means one of these days. The offenders have been charged to appear before court whilst efforts are being made to apprehend Gugu. President John Mahama and his Colombian counterpart, President Juan Manuel Santos, have discussed further cooperation between Ghana and Colombia and mutual support to find solutions to common problems facing the two nations, especially in the area of sustainable development and illegal mining. The two leaders met on the sidelines of the seventh session of the World Urban Forum ongoing in the Colombian capital of Medellin. The leaders are said to have met after President Mahama delivered the keynote address at the World Urban Forum in his capacity as a designated champion of the African urban agenda. President Manuel Santos expressed admiration for President Mahama's leadership, thanking him for his support during the recent opening of the Colombian embassy in Accra. President Mahama said Africa and South America are geographically linked, noting the Atlantic should rather be a bridge than a barrier between the two countries. He added that Ghana, with a growing economy and a growing middle class, offers many opportunities for closer partnership with Colombia, especially private partnerships to provide mass public transportation systems. They also discussed lessons to be learned from how Colombian authorities have transformed Medellin as well as skills development and training for the youth. Present at the discussion were the Colombian Foreign Minister Maria Angela Hogun, Senior Advisor to the President Al Haji Baba Kamara, Minister for local government and rural development, Akwesi Opon Fosu, Accra Metropolitan Chief Executive Alfredo Kovandapoy, and the Head of Communications of the Presidency, Ben Duchemalo. 
Now back home, former Botswana President Festus Mungai is calling for more engagement of African leaders with the youth on the continent. Festus Mungai is in the country to deliver a lecture at the University for Development Studies. The former Botswana leader called on Vice President Christy Imisa Arthur at the Flagstaff House. Festus Mohai was led to the presidency by authorities of the University for Development Studies. We had the opportunity to have the first one being delivered by His Excellency Obasanjo, former Niger, Nigerian president. And uh, we thought that was uh, something on a good foot. And that you know, the idea of an African leadership uh, lecture series must be sustained. But next uh, assignment would be the lecture, uh, the lecture series which will start. Uh, hopefully tomorrow, and then uh, continue to uh, the culmination in a special congregation. Vice President Emisa Arthur said the UDS and Ghana as a whole look forward to tapping from his wealth of experience in leadership. Um, your life was um, as an example to many of us. We hope that we will learn a little bit from the great experience, the great store of experience that you have. And I know that the University of Development Studies will also bask in the glory of your great reputation and they will learn something from you. So, on behalf of the government and the people of Ghana, let me welcome the Excellency, the former President, to Ghana. I hope that you have a nice day. And um, I also plan to, to come and learn something from, from you, uh, hopefully, at your last lecture. Festus Mohai said learning is a continuum that he is willing to be a part of. In our language, we say you are never too old to learn. So that applies to me, that applies to them. It's a question of we as Africans interacting on the challenges that we face and maybe retelling how certain situations were handled, sometimes well and other times badly. And uh, that's all in the process of, 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 of learning. Speaking to the media, he emphasized the need for all to be part of governance and management of national resources. It's, a, it's our responsibility, our common responsibility as, as Africans, especially you young guys. Uh, you are in the majority uh, and so on. And um, we have African leaders must engage you, you young people, including about the priorities in managing natural resources. But remember, the world owes nobody a living. You yourself have to pull up by your socks and make contribution to the development of your, your countries. Governments can't do everything. Governments have to facilitate uh, whatever and your endeavors are. Kirti Andropia, Joy News, Flagstaff House. Up next is Business News. Hello there, time now for some business reports with me, Abigail Adomakoenchi. Now, Goyal Company Limited has presented over 1.4 million Ghana CDs to government as a share of dividends for 2012. It brings to 5.84 million CDs a dividend paid to government since 2009. The Finance Ministry received a dividend on behalf of government as a majority shareholder with 51% shares in the company. Goyal Company Limited in charge of marketing and distributing petroleum products in the country has seen an average increase of 13.9% in the dividend it pays to government on its shares. After paying a dividend of 840,000 cities on its shares in 2009, Goyal's dividends to government rose to over 1.4 million cities on their 2012 accounts. The company has a, a policy not to, uh, to, to give out a minimum of 30% of its profits, and that's what we did for 2012. 2013 accounts are out, and I'm sure your share is going to be bigger than what it is now. And we apologize for the slight delay in present. Governments while lauding the efforts of Goyle also urged them and other joint venture companies as well as state-owned companies to be timely in paying their dividends. In 2014 budget, we program to collect an amount of 57.9 million as dividends for the year. We have yet to receive the dividend in respect of your 2013 account. 
and the provisional for 2014. So I will take this opportunity to urge you to do well to pay the 2013 account, dividend on 2013 account, and if possible, go ahead and pay the 2014 as well. KCL at Tufosin also called on Goyal to be competitive and profitable and I assure it fulfills its quest to move beyond the frontiers of Ghana in the marketing and distribution of energy products. So we'll stay with petroleum and speakers at the Fed Ghana Oil and Gas Summit have called on Ghanaian oil and gas companies to take advantage of the local content ally currently in force and actively participate in the growing oil and gas industry. He also asked local players in the industry to attract international expertise while foreign companies source for good local companies to partner. The Fifth Oil and Gas Summit presents a platform for Ghana to share opportunity for businesses in the gas and particularly the oil sector after about seven years of its discovery and production in commercial quantities. The summit brought together about 100 exhibitors for this year and will feature a two-day conference to discuss issues including local content and opportunities available to indigenous companies in the industry. The local content ally became operational on February 19 this year and the Petroleum Commission says it is working on projects projects to assist local companies in that regard. The local content committee, um, which is pursuant to the Petroleum Commission Act, has been set up. The local content implementation program has been approved. The commission is ensuring compliance, monitoring and enforcement through, one, the development of industry guidelines. We also are working on a local content common qualification system. The local content procurement template which has been developed and shared with a number of companies. Investigations into operational issues and the auditing process. We are also enforcing strict compliance of the airline in the areas of legal services in the country. We are working with the financial institutions in the area specifically of insurance. The GMPC meanwhile projected $20 billion profit in exploration activities in the sector over the next five years, hence the need for indigenous companies to actively participate in the industry without compromising the standards. The Ghanaian industry is open to business, but there has to be participation by Ghanaian companies in this industry. I therefore agree with the industry commentators that the Ghana's local content policy and its associated legislative instruments epitomize the best chance of not only ensuring increased Ghanaian participation in the oil and gas sector, but also Ghana's best hope of effectively integrating the sector into the rest of the national economy. In this new industry, Ghanaian citizens and companies, especially those in the Western region, would develop new capabilities that could make them competitive in the petroleum and other industries. He added that government is working assiduously to complete the water basing and 10 projects to produce the estimated 100,000 barrels of oil per day at peak. So Deputy Finance Minister Kessila Tofor Singh has debunked reports that Ghana is at the IMF World Bank Spring Meetings currently underway in Washington, D.C. to seek financial support from the fund. He however admits government would not rule out that possibility but insists Ghana has in place credible fiscal consolidation measures. The Finance Minister Setekwe is currently leading government delegation to the IMF World Bank Spring Meetings held annually in Washington, D.C. Although the meeting is to discuss issues including increasing agricultural productivity in Africa and implications for fiscal policy, there are reports Ghana is attending with hopes of gaining fiscal support from the IMF. But the Deputy Minister for Finance, Kesio Latofo Singh, disagrees. He however says it is possible for Ghana as a member of the IMF to solicit financial support from the fund. And that will be all for business. Keep up rest with business news on myjoonline.com. Sports is up next. Let's talk some sports now and a three-day workshop on international scientific network for sports for development is underway at the University of Ghana with the aim of utilizing sports as a tool for achievement of development goals. A research network for sports for development, International Scientific Network for Sports for Development has been launched in Accra. 
The network is a collaboration of seven research-based organizations and aims to develop a global framework for sports for development and a learning platform for sports researchers in Africa. The network, which is made up of the Sports Directorate of the University of Ghana, Chiraparamba Sports Academy, University of Western Cape, OPED Ghana, Interdisciplinary Center of Excellence for Sports Science and Development and International Sports Science for Physical Education is currently undertaking a three-day workshop at the University of Ghana. Professor Detlef Dumont, a member of the network, emphasized the need to take a deeper look at sports for development. Dr. Bella Bello Bitugu, director of the University of Ghana Sports Directorate, said the workshop on completion will outdoor a working plan for promoting the concept of sports for development. The workshop is supported by the German government and will also develop a toolkit that would provide information for ground action. The University of Ghana has thrown its support for the research and was evident as the institution was represented by the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation and Development, Professor John Japong, who indicated the university would soon introduce a college of education which will have a department of sports studies to serve as a platform for adequate study into sports issues. Right, so apparently there's been some breaking news that George has been following upon, and so he's going to be sharing that with us. It has to do with the Haiti Powers Bukum Banku Bout, yeah. which uh, you're saying that what? It has been called off? Effectively. Let, 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 let me just give you the blocks. First of all, you know, it was initially scheduled for 18th April, that was Good Friday. Okay. Haiti Powers said that wasn't a good date after his spiritual deliverance, uh, you know, with Prophet Tati uh, Joshua. Sure. Now, after that, the date was rescheduled to 16th May. And the GBA, I mean the Ghana Boxing Authority, actually said they wanted to get the confirmation from Ayite Powers whether he was comfortable with the bout. They gave him one week to do that. That's yeah. what actually comes in. And so he comes out after one week today and tells the GBA that he's not psychologically prepared, he's not mentally prepared, he's not spiritually prepared, and he wants to put the fight on hold. Where does that happen? And he's talking now, and, and when he was asked more questions, he said he actually needs to hear from God to get the date now. So we have moved from rescheduling dates to when his godfather, Prophet TB Joshua, would tell him when to fight. I think at this point, Alex Ntiamwa, who is the promoter of the bout, has actually given up. It looks like everybody is being, uh, you know, we're, we're, just, we're just playing pranks on everybody. It's the, just not making the, sense anymore. No, this this is a major, a major disappointment. Disappointment, super sports the, like this. The, yeah, there are implications. A lot of implications, TV3 and in this, loads of uh, stakeholders in this. What will happen now? Complain all this and monies are gone. Remember, tickets are already on sale. Uh, a number of tickets have been sold. In fact, when they started the ticket sales, about 3,000 tickets were sold on just the first day. I would imagine about uh, close to 6,000 tickets have been sold now. What's happening now is that Alexin Tiamwa says that according to the GBA rules, the GBA will have to sit down and decide what the penalty is going to be. But obviously, even if Tiamwa is not ec excited with what's um, the sort of uh, TMI is a promoter. the verdict is going to be. If he's not excited with that, he can move that to the court, uh, the court of law. And I think that's what's going to happen right now. This is a big joke that has been carried on for just too long. Absolutely nothing about this. And we just don't understand. Aite Powers goes on and on and talks about spiritual stuff, talks about this. It's just not making sense at this point. And let's just get this, because even the promoter believes that at this point, the bout is as good as cancelled. Effectively, the bout is cancelled. It's too bad. Though. It's just too bad. Too but there's bad. some, so there's oh some yeah. good news. And good news for you, definitely. Exactly. Um, uh, you were Champions League. So share it with me and, and the rest uh, of uh, the world. Okay, Chelsea have qualified to the semi finals of the Europa Champions League. It was very tight for them, you know, exactly, because they lost the first leg by three goals to one, and it was going to be very difficult. Semi final. Um, let's find out what happens to Manchester United tomorrow. It's going to be very interesting to find out how many goals they're going to be. Uh, Conceding. Well, we're talking about probably, you know, a goal harvest, but they're bringing a <laughs> Bayern is bringing a basket. Oh, no, no, it's not going to be too bad. Don't mind, Israel. Okay, okay. congratulations. All you right. have a good night, then. You join us with some more. <laughs> now, what makes you watch one movie and not another? People, you know, every part of the world, they watch movies as a form of entertainment. And it turns out it's not just about the stories, but the title that comes with it. Todd, you stood me up for two unpleasant hours. Yeah, who cares? I'm not joking, Todd. And I'm not laughing either. This is not a joke, is it? I'm not a comedian, am I? <laughs> the Ghanaian movie industry has no doubt grown over the years.
It is serving as a key form of entertainment and provide jobs for retailers. I noticed in my research for what goes into movie lovers buying one movie or the other. I came across many intriguing titles. They include I Speed on Your Grave, Contract, Atempo, Man on Fire, or Kukuseku, among others. So I paused to find out how marketable these titles are. Our business move with the title. Some of them, if they listen to the title outside, they feel like buying the movie to watch what, a, what to go on. Because if you listen to the title, how would the story be? You get me? So most of them, they came because of the title. To my customers, they prefer like the original stories, like the foreign movies, such like the Bollywood. Because most of their Ghanaian movies, be it Gollywood or Kumawood, they get most of their stories from this Bollywood. So I conclude that if a movie title is not attractive enough, it may never appeal to its target audience because that largely determines patronage. Movie producers and all stakeholders alike should take a cue from this. And I'll be it for showbiz. Showbiz was brought to you by... That's it for the bulletin. Before we go, we bring a recap of our top stories. There have been more revelations from investigations into operations of the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority. The sole judgment debt commissioner has blamed negligence and unpatriotic public officers for massive amounts paid out as inordinate judgment debts. University teachers are threatening to boycott lectures on April 15 over scrapping of their book and research allowances.